Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. I'm Rachel O'Mara, and I'm here to introduce Mark McCluskey today. We're very excited to host Mark here at Google Mountain View. Mark is the CEO of Wired.com, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, and also has his first book out, Faster, Higher, Stronger. So we're going to be hearing Mark talk about all of the proudness of athletes and how technology and data helps people strive to be better athletes. Please welcome Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me here. This is exciting to get to come to talk to you all about, um, about this book that I've spent so long working on. Um, the first question almost everyone asks me is like, why did you write this book? It's very interesting that people always want to understand the reasons that you come to a, a subject matter. Um, this is me at 17, um, looking really, really gaunt um, as a cyclist. Uh, that's Franklin Shop and Save. That's Franklin, Pennsylvania. That was the local grocery store chain. And I talked them into sponsoring a cycling team. They sort of really didn't understand what I meant by a cycling team. But um, the investment was minimal, and they, uh, they were talked into it. That's my best friend growing up, Mike Dittman, in front of me there. Um, I talked him into racing bikes. He had been a swimmer. But I just started a cycling team. I needed a team. And so it, it seemed sensible that there'd be more than one of me on the team. Um, this is sort of the first American bike boom. Greg LeMond had just won uh, the Tour de France in 1986. Uh, the John Tesh coverage on CBS with like the weird synth music that they'd play. And, um, and I loved it. I thought it was the most amazing sport ever. And it really um, became a huge part of my life. And you know, like most young athletes, I had dreams. I had dreams that someday I'll ride in the Olympic Games, someday I'll ride in the Tour de France, right? You know, so you know, you get all the gear and the kit, you grow the mullet because that was cool then. Um, uh, somebody should have talked to me about a lot of hair decisions. Um, this is outside a, a race in Lordstown, Ohio, and yeah, and I, I did I finished second that day. I still remember the sprint I lost that race in. Um, so I was good. I wasn't great, and I was a I was a pretty big fish in a very small pond. Uh, American cycling, especially American cycling in rural Western Pennsylvania in 1989, was not a big pool of talent, and so you know you didn't necessarily have to be that great. Um, Got older, went to college, went to school in Minnesota, and um, the results started to change for me. Um, I started getting killed, and I did not handle that well. Um, it was really disappointing to me to lose races the way I was losing races. Um, my team, we qualified for nationals our freshman year, and we got destroyed there um, by schools like schools out here where it was sunny and they rode all year, and we had been. On, the, on trainers all winter. Um, it didn't, I had reached a plateau. There wasn't the progression that I thought I would see from the work I was getting. I saw people around me who were working much less and who were just really beating me very badly. Um, so I kind of gave it up. I, I stopped riding. I actually stopped riding for about 10 years, pretty much full stop, because it had never been a recreational activity for me. It had always been a very competitive activity. Um, I still dreamed of going to the Olympics. Um, and I found, it, I found a different way to do that. Um, <laughs> still some bad hair choices there on the left. Um, that's my credential for the 1996 Olympics at SI. You can't see the ponytail. Um, so I started my career at Sports Illustrated as a journalist and then have been in Wired for nine years. I've covered three Olympics, tons of other um, high-end sporting events. And those questions really still loomed in my mind, what separates great athletes from even very, very good athletes? What are those distinctions that, that lead to being on the top of the Olympic podium? Um, and I've been lucky enough through my career to get to meet a lot of those athletes and coaches and scientists. And, and that's really where this book came from. Um, so you know, one place that, that my career took me was um, to London on August 5th, 2012. Uh, I'm going to play a quick video. This is the 100 meter final. Um, one thing to watch here is right before the final, it's going to happen sort of be t behind those purple lane markers. Somebody actually throws a bottle from the stands and tries to hit the runners before the start of this race. Thankfully, that didn't work, but uh, just something to watch. But we're going we're gonna to watch this race real quick. 
Oh, they're away, and Gatling got away brilliantly and he's ahead of the field at the moment and uh, Bolt going very and here comes Usain Bolt! Usain Bolt storming through, he takes it again, Blake gets the silver, 9.64! Oh, he's retained his title in the most emphatic way! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! Usain Bolt of Jamaica is the fastest man on the planet! So first of all, let's talk about how awesome that announcer is, and, and how much I, <laughs> you know, he's, he's retained his title in the most emphatic way, and, and at the end says, Usain Bolt is the fastest man on the planet. And that's, that's the title that we give the person who wins the Olympic 100 meters. Um, incidentally, this was my view of that moment. Um, they do move pretty fast. You can see that my camera couldn't quite actually resolve the runners. I actually sort of, I actually love the sort of abstract nature of this. Um, one other thing about it, this is the fastest 100 meters ever run. The, the first seven blurs there finished under 10 seconds. Um, and that's Asafa Powell in the back. He pulled his hamstring in the race and would have been under 10 seconds. And there's never been a race with eight runners under 10 seconds before. Here's a slightly clearer view of the finish of that race. Uh, this is the, the photo finish uh, shot. So you think Usain Bolt's the fastest man on the planet. And, and when you watch that video, it does look emphatic. It looks like he's destroyed these guys, right? It's important to remember how small the margins are at the elite level. Um, Will Hopkins is a um, sports scientist in New Zealand who's done a lot of work trying to understand the individual variation of athletes' performances. Not the differences between athletes, but the difference in an athlete in his performances. and and by crunching a lot of numbers, Will's a, a statistician. Um, in short track and field events, that variation is about 8 tenths of a percent. So I've drawn a, a quick bell curve of 8 tenths of a percent on either side. So if we just play with a hypothetical here, that means that you know, Bull could have run as fast as 955, which destroys his own world record. Right? It's sort of an otherworldly time. Um, you could imagine him running as slowly as 971, which is still great, and it ekes out the wind. Uh, Blake ran a 9, um, 982. But of course, Bolt's not the only one who has that variation. So you can start to move all these guys around you. There's a scenario here with that variation at the same level of fitness, the same sort of platonic state that they were in, where Johan Blake wins and, um, and, and Bolt and Gatlin tie for the silver. Um, it's fun. You can just really start to mess with this. You can you can actually come with a three-way dead heat for gold and Tyson Gay just out of the medals. You can. You know, it's just fun to move these around. You you can have a four-way tie for bronze if you really want to mess with it. You know. um, the point being that you know, now we're back to what actually happened that day. The the point being that we take these, in this case, you know, under 10 seconds, and we think that that is the exact measurement of the athlete. And it is the exact measurement of that athlete for those 10 seconds. The next day, it's not the same. Um, an hour later, it's maybe not the same. You know, just, you know, there's so many factors that, that play into performance at this level. And so, so one of the ideas that I really explore in the book is how small those margins are and what it means to be playing at, at that level with those margins. Um, I want to talk about a few ideas that, that sort of cut across the book. The book's organized by, um, by things like nutrition and recovery and what is fatigue and skill acquisition. But then there are some sort of themes that I think resonate throughout the book. And, and I want to talk about those with you today. This is the first one. Um, lots of little things become big changes. Um, Dave Brailsford here, uh, he took over British cycling about a decade ago. Um, British cycling was a laughing stock. It was a terrible, terrible program. Be between 1924 and 1988, they did not win a single gold medal at the Olympics or World Championships. They actually um, had won two bronzes in that time at the Olympics. It was a mess. It, it was, you know, France, Germany, Italy, even the US had started to outperform the Brits in cycling and especially track cycling. And so they really started to think about why that was and what did they need to do to change their results. And they came up with a, a different approach. And, and Brailsford described it as the perform, performance through the aggregation of marginal gains. 
what did he mean by marginal gains? You know, we, we think of trying to improve performance as, as this idea of like we find one big awesome thing and suddenly we're 10% better or 5% better or at the elite level even 2% better is a huge change. I would argue that there aren't many of those left, especially at the elite level. We, we're pretty good at this stuff now. It, you know, we've only been doing it about 150 years, sort of sports as we think of them. But we've optimized a lot of things. And our understanding, especially in the past 50 years, has really boomed. It's really hard to find a big thing. There are a couple that people have been playing with, and I'll talk about some of those. What, what Brailsford and British Cycling sort of theorized was, OK, like, let's stop looking for big things. So instead of one thing that will get me 10%, let me start to add up 10 things at a percent each, or at a tenth of a percent each, and then when I stack these on top of each other, I start to get somewhere. You know, these, these improvements sort of accrue like interest in this scenario, and, and those little changes really add up. So let me give you some examples of what they did. Um, the first thing they did was they started to spend an immense amount of time and energy on their equipment. Uh, the nickname they gave themselves was the Secret Squirrel Club. It was this little, yeah, we, would call it, we would call it a skunk works, right? But uh, the, the British phrase was Secret Squirrel Club. Um, Dimitris uh, Constantis was a Greek competitive track cyclist who then um, became a composites engineer. So he was uniquely sort of qualified when they came to him and said, build us the fastest bike in the world. And so he went and spent a couple of years and built, this is the, the Mark II of the track frame. Uh, he built the Mark I. His frames have won over 50 gold medals at the Olympic and World Championship level. They're incredibly successful frames. They're crazy, crazy light. They are incredibly stiff, and they're super aerodynamic. You can see some of the shaping on the tubes. Um, you know, they would do a lot of work. Um, British motorsport is a very huge resource, especially on the aerodynamic side, F1. All of, the, all of the F1 constructors live in Great Britain. And so they did a lot of work with the F1 people. The, the handlebar there is, um, is another thing they did. You, you can see the shaping there, again, looking for aerodynamics. They, they, they called it the Cobra, is what um, the riders called it. One thing that's interesting about track cycling now, and this is something caused by this crazy arms race on equipment, is the UCI, which is the world governing body for cycling, now requires you to make, they have to race on equipment that can be purchased. You can't make bespoke gear that is unavailable to the public. Um, so it's really hard to buy because they actually don't want to sell it. Uh, so it took me um, three emails and a couple of phone calls for them to send me. This is from the brochure that you, I finally extracted from British Cycling. Um, I, I'm now going to put up the prices for each of these things. Um, so that's a 25,000 pound track frame. So the frame's 25,000 pounds. The bars are 23,000 pounds. So you add it up, that's 48,000, oh, you know, almost 49,000 pounds, or approximately according to Google's search engine, um, $78,000. And that's for a frame and stems. No wheels, none of, no equipment. The, hel the helmet that they uh, use, they will sell you for about 10,000 pounds. It's, you know, it's incredibly expensive gear. Um, it's very successful gear, and they think it gives them a huge edge. So that's one gain. Anybody who's ever slept in a hotel has slept on a bad pillow. Um, and woken up, and their neck is killing them, right? Um, British cyclists travel with their own pillows for that reason and for another reason, which is the same reason that they're incredibly obsessive hand washers and, frankly, won't shake your hand when they meet you because you could be sick or you could have seen someone who was sick or you could have been around someone who was sick or somebody who was sick could have been in your hotel room. 7% of competitors at the London Olympics in 2012 got sick. And that sucks. <laughs> you know, getting sick during the Olympics after a lifetime of training is a terrible, terrible thing to have happen to you. So anything you can do to ameliorate that risk is hugely important. Another, um, another trick in the uh, British cycling arsenal, and not just British cyclists, uh, is beet juice. This is kind of the hottest performance drink in athletics right now. 
here's how it works. So you, we all think we, we all probably think that nitrates and nitrites are bad for us because there were studies done usually on um, processed meats, cured meats, and linking those to possible higher instances of cancer. First of all, those studies are really iffy, so I would suggest you not worry about it quite as much as perhaps you do. But also, it turns out that nitrates have really interesting effects on the bodies. So beet juice is very high in nitrate. Um, in the body, that's turned into nitrite and then into nitric oxide. Nitric oxide in the bloodstream does two things. The first thing it does is it actually dilates the blood vessel. The blood vessel gets bigger. And that means that more blood flows through that blood vessel. And that's good if you're an endurance athlete because you're getting more blood to the muscle. You can power your, your efforts more effectively. The other is, and, and this is even more crazy, it seems to make the mitochondria inside of that muscle more efficient. So a twofer of I can get more blood and oxygen to the muscle and the mitochondria uses it more efficiently is really awesome. That's, you know, it's sort of like, hooray. Um, this is not so marginal. Um, right now, it looks like about 3%, um, and that's for efforts between 5 and 30 minutes. Uh, for shorter efforts, for efforts less than 5 minutes, um, this energy pathway isn't really the energy pathway that powers that sort of muscular work. For more than 30 minutes, that research is ongoing. It, it's, it's a little iffier. There's some studies that seem pretty good. There are some that seem not so good. But but there is some hint that even for longer efforts, it has that benefit. Um, ironically, it has more benefit for people like me or any other weekend warriors in the room than it does for elite athletes. They've optimized some of those pathways already. They have incredibly good capillary density in their muscles, so they're getting as much blood as they possibly can to their muscles. Um, I don't because I'm out of shape. and so. Uh, this seems to work better, actually, for sort of like recreationally active athletes than, um, than elite athletes. All that said, elite athletes are using it because there doesn't seem to be any downside. In fact, um, Andy Jones is the researcher in the UK who's done most of the work on this. Um, his Twitter handle is Andy Beetroot, is how much he likes beet juice. Uh, he was telling me that during the London Olympics, it was actually very hard to buy beet juice in London because all of the teams were buying so much of it. Uh, it, it does have one downside. Mark Cavendish is a world champion. and. Um, <laughs> The, the hashtag pissing rainbows never quite took off as much as you might think. Uh, uh, it, it was interesting when you click on that hashtag and see what else shows up. Um, um, uh, be, be ready for that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, if you're going to drink a lot of beet juice, be ready, because it will, it will do things. Um, track races take place at a standing start. So track cycling races. So you, you're held either by a coach or sort of in a timing device that like sort of levers the bike and lets you go when, when the race starts. So that traction in that moment is really important. Um, they believe, British Cycling believes, that by wiping down the tires with isopropyl alcohol, getting them as clean as possible, and it actually leaves them slightly tacky, depending on the rubber compound, that they get a little benefit on that start. You know, it's maybe a thousandth of a second. But thousandths of a second matter. Like track races are won or lost by a thousandth of a second. Um, one more here. This is Laura Trott, uh, a, a Great Britain cyclist. Um, she's wearing hot pants, um, which is what they called these warm up pants that they developed with uh, Adidas and one of the universities in the UK. And track you know, they do a huge warm up. And then there's a holding area where the cyclists have to sit and wait for their race, sometimes up to 30 minutes. And as you do that, your muscles start to cool off. And part of the point of the warm up is to have the muscles warm because that helps blood flow. Um, these, these pants have heating elements, especially along the thighs and, and the hamstrings, um, actually at 107 degrees. And so they would do their warm ups, they put them on, and they'd sit there uh, in, in the area, in the holding area, with those on, peel them off get on the bike, do their race. Um, ironically, or perhaps not ironically, but interestingly, um, Australia showed up with a very similar idea. Uh, it was an idea that everybody sort of 
that at least those two countries, which are sort of neck and neck in, in sports science in a lot of ways, came to at the same time. Um, the first study they published is insane, the effect of this. They found a 9% improvement in sprint performance on, on athletes who wore these. Um, I'll be interested to see if that's replicable, because that's huge. Um, they aren't the most flattering pant that was ever, uh, ever built. Um, Laura probably didn't mind this is after winning her second gold medal. I love this picture of her mom, especially. Um, so, You add all of this up, and you had an incredibly successful program. Of the, of the 10 gold medals available in track cycling in London, the UK won seven of them. Um, and would have won an eighth, except they were disqualified for crossing, um, crossing a line on the track by about a centimeter, which is not the sort of mistake British cyclists make very often, frankly. To me, it just really shows the power of adding up those small gains, especially in an elite environment where the margins are so small, that if you, if you really interrogate every single thing that you're doing, every single part of your program, and try and optimize every vector of it, it's hard to do, right? It's, it's exhausting work to think that way. Um, but it can have pretty huge benefits. The next idea I want to talk about is this, uh, n equals 1. For the science types in the room, um, n is the size of the population under study in an experiment. Uh, human beings are incredibly individual. Crazily, crazily individual, and like, and I say that, and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, no, you're, we're individuals, right? And like, no, seriously, we're like really, really, really individual. So much of how we perform in an athletic context is, is comes down to genetic factors. It comes down to things that are unique to each of us as individuals, from nutrition to motivation to how we respond to training, to our physiology, to our morphology, the size of our bodies. And so I want to talk about a couple of those things. <laughs> Wendy Fox is a designer in uh, Melbourne who did this project. This is um, every female gold medalist from London. She sells this awesome poster. I would need to order one. Um, she, uh, she was kind enough to let me use, use this material. Um, this, this is one of those gold medalists, um, a, a rower. Um, Helen Glover um, had only been rowing for four years when she won this gold medal. Uh, and, and you might say, hey, but 10,000 hours. And, OK, so I'm, I'm here to say that 10,000 hours isn't the be all and end all. Because there are things that sports require of us that we may or may not have innate abilities toward. So, Helen had been a, um, a competitive field hockey player in the UK, and a, a pretty good one. She got not quite, she got, in the UK, it's the county level. It's sort of like the state level here in the US, not to the national or international level. And she had sort of plateaued there. UK sport had this program, and I love the name of it. They called it Sporting Giants. And in 2007, they put out a call for tall athletes, because there are some sports or being tall is really, really important. We all know basketball is certainly one of those. Volleyball is one of those. Team handball, which is another team sport in the Olympics, is one of them. Rowing is one of them. Being tall and rowing, all other things being equal, is awesome because it's a physics problem. You have a longer lever, basically, to move an oar. So, so if you were a woman who was taller than um, 5'11", you were asked to to submit an application to this program. For the men, I believe it was 6'2". Um, you might not think 5'11 is that tall. You sort of think, oh, 5'11 is tall, but not crazy tall. Um, fewer than 3% of women on the planet are taller than 5'10". Uh, in the US, it's 2.4. In the UK, it's a little less than that. So 5'10 is pretty tall. So fewer than 3% of women were wider 5'10". 16 of the 17 Olympic rowing gold medalists were 5'10 or taller. Now, it's it's really helpful. It's hard to compete being shorter than that. Um, I did leave off the coxswain, who was not. Um, so that's cheating. I guess it's 16 of the 18. Um, this is not an average population. This, this is actually uh, the, the average woman in the United States is 5'4 and 158 pounds. Um, and then you line her up against a couple of gold medalists that, that show the range here. That's Gabby Douglas. 
uh, the gymnast who's five inches shorter and weighs 70 pounds less. Being small and light as a gymnast or a diver, again, a huge advantage. You're, you're rotating a mass. You want something short and light because you can rotate it faster. You can complete more spins. Um, Sylvia Foles uh, is 13 inches taller and weighs 43 pounds more. Obviously, you know, Sylvia at 6'5 uh, is actually the tallest gold medalist um, in, in London. So, that diversity of body type um, is a relatively recent phenomenon at the, um, at the Olympic level. David Epstein, who wrote um, a great book called The Sports Gene, referred to it as the big bang of body types, that there used to be a sort of like generalized athlete body type in the middle, and that that's really sort of exploded into this diversity that you see. Um, there, there's no athlete in the Olympic Games who's sort of average. Um, it, it just doesn't happen. Let's, let's talk. I, I don't have a name for Average Woman USA. I, see, I keep thinking it would be, I, it'd be great to give her a name. And, and let's think about actually 100 of her. Because um, I want to talk about another sort of factor that leads into elite performance, and that's your response to training. Uh, this is Claude Bouchard. Claude is a, uh, a researcher who grew up in Quebec City. He was Tell me if the story sounds familiar from the start. He was a hockey player. He was pretty good. Then he stopped growing. Other guys got bigger. And he wasn't able to compete anymore. And when you talk to him about it, he's like, I just didn't know what was happening. I didn't know why, why I couldn't get bigger. And the answer is, well, because genetic. Like, we know that height is about 70% heritable. And uh, he didn't have the genetics to get taller, like me. Those questions sort of stuck with him. And as he started his scientific career, he started wondering about the genetic bases of, of these differences in athletic ability. Um, he started a study called Heritage, which is sort of the key study on, on genetic variation as it applies to athletic performance, and has been extracting data from that for about 15 years. It's one of these huge population studies. They took a, a huge group of sedentary people, put them on the same training program, and then measured how much they progressed. Your average person in that 20-week program has an improvement somewhere between 15 and 25%. And to be really technical about it, that's the increase in their VO2 max, their ability to process oxygen as an endurance athlete. Um, so back to our 100 average woman USAs, 60% sit right in the middle of that bell curve somewhere between 15 and 25% improvement. Those are your sort of normal training responses. An another 25% have responses that are a little further out on the curve, either below normal or above normal, but, but not terribly extreme. So now we're down to extreme responders, and we're down to 15%. We're down to 15 out of our 100 average women. 7 to 8% of that population will have very low responses like zero improvement or 1% improvement. Matter of fact, some of these people will show adverse responses. Their cholesterol will go up. Their, their blood pressure will go up, which is, we don't ever even really consider that possibility. But for some people, exercise is not a benefit. So now we're down. We're left with 7 or 8% of the population, again, with a high response to aerobic endurance training. So these are people like 8% of the population, roughly, I would argue, even has a shot here at, at reaching the elite level. Like, you know, you can be a normal responder and have a high baseline and, and have a nice athletic career. Um, when you really look at the sort of VO2 max values that you need to have to compete at the elite level, which are crazy town, um, for, for women, they tend to be in the 70s. For, for men, they're in the mid-80s to even there's been some 90s, which are insane. Um, it's not even enough to be a high responder. It's not even enough to be one of these eight people, because you need to also have a high baseline. You know, if I start from a 40 and can get you know, a 30% increase, I'm nowhere near where I need to be. I need to start at 50. I need to start at 55, which is already a pretty extreme value. Um, you can crunch the numbers on that. You get somewhere between two and three percent of the population sort of has that that combination of high baseline plus high trainability. 
it's a pretty small slice. I mean, before anything else happens, before you even have to start to train or work or do any of the things to actually actualize any of this, that's a pretty small chunk of the population that we're talking about as, as, as given the, the possibility of this sort of success. Um, Richard Lewinton has this great quote that, uh, that I really like. Um, genes determine the size of the bucket, and environment is how much is poured into it. So for an athlete, that environment is work and practice and opportunity. Like, you know, I, maybe I would have been like a world-class soccer player. I, I don't know. I didn't really play soccer. So it wasn't even an opportunity for me. Um, th th this metaphor really changed this summer with the ice bucket stuff, but um, I, I still like it. Data has been a huge theme, obviously. Coming to Google and talking about data um, is, is a little intimidating. Uh, it's really changed sports, especially in the past 10 years, I would say. Um, but I want to go way back to um, the 20s. This is the uh, Western Electric plant in uh, Cicero, Illinois, also known as the Hawthorne Works. And for those of you who um, have done your social science stuff. Um, there were really famous experiments done here in the 20s and 30s, sort of that dawn of like scientific management. Um, there were 40,000 workers at this plant every day, uh, and, and they were trying to become more efficient. How can we make them make more stuff? And so uh, researchers from Harvard came out and started doing research on productivity, and one of the groups they researched was this group, who made telephone relay switches, which were these big switches that, that physically made your telephone calls go where they needed to go. There's some controversy about these studies. Like, was the data good? So bear with me, because there, it's a little apocryphal here. What they did is they started to raise, they, they're like, well, if we put more light in here, maybe they can see better. Maybe the workers can see better, and they can make more switches. And they turned up the lights, and, yeah, and lo and behold, they made more switches, more relay switches. And they're like, OK, that's cool. And they turn the lights back down to the level that they started at, and the workers made more switches. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, OK, well, that's weird. What if we turn the lights down? And they turn the lights down a little bit, and they made more switches. And then they turn them back. And then, so they do all these environmental studies, the heat, cold, all of this. Everything made them more productive. <laughs> which is the sort of thing that scientific management professors in the 20s and 30s like, whoa. Um, and so they tried to figure out why. So here's where some of the controversy is. The Hawthorne effect is typically presented as the knowledge that you are being observed, being studied, causes you to change your behavior. Um, I think that's actually pretty compelling. I don't know that these studies actually prove that. Um, you know, one explanation, just as a side note, is these weren't workers who ever got much feedback at the time, right? And so they never really knew how many switches they made. And suddenly they had somebody in a lab coat standing over them saying, hey, you made 50 switches or you made 60 switches. I'm like, oh, cool, maybe I can make 65. You know, like we've all experienced that, right? You give me an artificial goal, I'll try and surpass it. Um, so you know, it's it, it's possible that the operators really got feedback in a way that they had never, and almost coaching in a way they never had before. Setting that aside, the idea that we change our behavior when we're tracking data about ourselves, I think, is kind of indisputable at this point. We've seen this boom in wearables in the in the consumer space. Um, I've how many of you have played with these? So, and. And you notice that, like, even if it's as silly as, like, oh, I don't have 10,000 steps yet today, and you're sort of marching around your living room at 10 o'clock at night, you know, that's, that's behavior change. Behavior change is really hard. The science of behavior change is, is filled with failed attempts to get people to change what they do. Um, it, it's a really compelling way to start to change your behavior. Now, let's take that and put it into athletic context. I'm going to go back to myself, racing bikes in 1987. The only book, that, so growing up in Western Pennsylvania, there were no cycling coaches, believe me. Um, there was the guy at the bike shop 
who was sort of my guru. And there was a book called Bicycle Road Racing written by Eddie Borshevsky, who had been the US cycling team coach in 1984. He was a Polish guy. One of Eddie's tips in that book was uh, if it was hot out, you had your cycling cap on because you didn't wear a helmet because that wasn't a thing that cyclists did then. If it was hot out, you could put a cabbage leaf underneath your, um, your cycling cap, just like tour riders did in the 20s and 30s. Um, we no longer carried our spare tires looped like that, although I think it's a pretty awesome look. <laughs> you know, that was, that was the advice that I got from the guy who coached in the Olympic team in 1984, is a cabbage leaf. Um, um, it kind of does, right? It's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it kind of does help. In the mid-70s, uh, Polar, the Finnish company created the first heart rate monitor. This isn't it. This is the one that came out in 1987. They did develop the first heart rate monitor, wireless heart rate monitor in 1977 for Finnish cross-country skiers to help them in their training. In 1987, they released this model, the PE300. I bought one of these. Um, I had a job, and I took every cent that I made in that job, and I bought gear, and nothing has changed. <laughs> um, the idea of training with heart rate was crazy new. And, and what this had, the first, this was the first thing that actually introduced the idea of target heart rate zones to, to anyone outside of a super elite training program. Um, so you know, you'd measure your resting heart rate and then sort of like do some math. It's like, well, if I'm training here, I'm training really hard. And if I'm training here, I'm not training so hard. Um, it's so crazy. I had that thing strapped to my handlebars. and tried to divine information from it with no coach or, or feedback. You know, two nights ago, I did this ride um, on, so this is on a Wahoo Kicker, which is this really amazing resistance trainer and trainer road. So this is the power profile that I rode. Um, this is an easy ride because, like I said, I'm out of shape. Um, this level of information and data about my performance and what I did, it, would have made my head probably explode as a like 17 year old, right? I'm just sort of like, I just went and rode. At the same time, actually, Greg LeMond and some of his colleagues were starting to do the first work on power. One nice thing about a bike and also rowing is you can directly measure the power that you output. It's so, so I could do this ride one day and my heart rate could be pretty low because I felt great. I could do this right another day, my heart rate could be 20 beats higher because I'm sick or I'm finding an infection or I'm not recovered from my previous ride. Heart rate's an okay way to approximate this. Power is an incredible way to know exactly. I know how much I, you know, I produced 250 kilojoules of energy in that ride, and which is not that much. Um, <laughs> It, it, this, this ability to really get into these things, this, this is another example of it. This is um, Zwift has actually just launched this for the cyclists in the room. This is a virtual, so massively multiplayer virtual cycling game that you can play with your power trainer and you network around the world. Here's what's nuts. Five pro teams, like pro tour teams, have talked about the fact that they're scouting people in this game. Because watts are watts, right? The numbers don't lie. If I can, you know, if I could go out and put out, famously, you know, a little over six watts a kilogram for an hour, I have the physiology to win the Tour de France, or at least be in the conversation. So if it's some dude on a trainer in uh, Omaha, that's fine. I know what he can do. You know, he might not be able to handle a bike, and we can work on that. But the physiology is the tough part. I just think it's incredible that they're scouting riders in this way. The wearables for consumers are, are well and good. This is sort of the professional version of it. Uh, Catapult Sports makes this. It's called the Optimi S5. Uh, Catapult came out of a project at the Australian Institute of Sport where they were really looking to track athletes' movement um, in competitive settings. So, so this little guy, you actually, um, this is a British rugby player. They tuck it in between the shoulder blades there. It's worn in lots of um, sort of common wealthy sports. So Aussie rules football, rugby players wear it. Um, tons of US teams have started using it in practice. It's not legal in games yet in the United States. And the people who are least interested in having it 
in competitive settings right now are the players, or specifically the players' unions. Because I know now, like, say at contract time, you know, like, yeah, you were great last year, but like this year, your average sprint acceleration's down, you know, a meter and a half a second. You know, what's wrong? Have you been staying out too late at night? Because I'm sort of tracking your sleep now, too, or I'd like to be. <laughs> I mean, these, these, these concerns about privacy are a really interesting subject. Um, culturally, I think we have a, a very different stance toward that than a lot of other countries do. You know, this is commonplace in, so in Aussie rules football, they actually use it like real-time telemetry. So I'm sure there are lots of Aussie rules fans watching and in the room. Um, it's a cool, it's kind of a weird, interesting game. One facet of it is you do substitutions in real time. Like the flow of the game doesn't stop and people run off and on. And so they're getting feeds from their players onto an iPad showing things like that acceleration rate. And like, you know, if Jim isn't accelerating the way he did at the start of the game, maybe he's the player I should be taking off for a rest right now. Um, you know, it's kind of like an F1 race, but with people and balls and tackling one another. Uh, one other thing about data, this is Kirk Goldsberry. Um, I write about Kirk in the book, and, and we did an excerpt in Wired about, about him. Um, he's a cartographer. He teaches at Harvard. And he's also a crazy basketball fan and basketball player. And as he watched NBA games, he thought to himself, from his experiences as a player, you know, I have places on the court where I'm really comfortable, where I love taking shots. And I have places on the court where I'm not comfortable and where I'm terrible taking shots. And do NBA players have that same thing? So it's an interesting question. The, the first trick in answering that question is finding the data to answer it. Um, what Kirk ended up doing is ESPN was running shot charts on their box scores, and he scraped all the data from that quasi-legally-ish. Um, and eventually was able to map every shot that every player in the NBA took over a five-year span and then compare individual players to that baseline, and you get two things here. So this is Dirk Nowitzki of the Dallas Mavericks. Size of the dot is how often the player shoots from there. The color from sort of cool to warm is how effective they are from that area compared to the average player. Um, so you see Dirk's a great three-point shooter from straight on. He's an unbelievable mid-range shooter, um, especially from the right side of the court. He's actually the best mid-range shooter in basketball, which is frankly not a very efficient shot. Uh, you, you know, the, the style of the time right now is to shoot three-pointers or try and be shooting layups or close to the basket. Um, so he was able to extract that from sort of rudimentary data. At, at the same time, uh, there's a camera right there at the bottom of the screen, uh, and this is at the United Center in Chicago. Uh, Stats Inc., which is uh, the company that provides statistical information to most U.S. pro leagues, had acquired this technology um, called SportView. It, it began as Israeli missile defense technology to try and optically detect missile launches uh, and was... Uh, adapted to sports, first soccer and then basketball, because tracking everything that happens on a basketball court is hard. Uh, so there are six cameras, and um, it tracks the position of everything on the court, all the players, the ball, the officials, uh, 25 times a second. So you get basically an XY coordinate for each of those things 25 times a second. So with that kind of data, you can go well beyond just sort of a shot chart. You can ask different questions. So Here's the next question Kirk answered. This is the scoring percentage that, that NBA players have on average close to the hoop. This is the most important territory on a basketball court to defend. And, and you can see like players are really successful scoring there. But when you swap in different defenders, what happens to people taking shots in that area? So any Warriors fans in the house, um, David Lee, who's been injured this year, is a terrible interior defender. <laughs> I really like David Lee as a player, but this is not David Lee's strong suit. David Lee is a good scorer and rebounder. He does not perform particularly well. Um, we'll see what his next contract looks like based on that information. Scoring and rebounding are actually easier to find than defense. Larry Sanders um, is an incredible interior defender. Um, 
he signed a $44 million contract the summer after Kirk published this research uh, with the Bucks. He scores like six points a game. It's, it's, it's about his defense. There's one other way to defend, and that's to stop your opponent from even taking a shot. So this looks at what happens when an opponent takes a shot. You can crunch the same numbers a different way. What defender, by his mere presence, suppresses shooting rates? Um, and when you do that, it was Dwight Howard. So he was a Laker at the time that uh, Kirk did this research. Opponents shoot 9% fewer shots when Howard is near the basket. <laughs> Like, imagine if he blocked 9% of shots. It's the same effect, right? It's the virtual blocked shot. It's an incredible thing. Um, in the crowd that day, um, when Kirk presented this at the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference at MIT, Daryl Morey is the uh, GM of the Houston Rockets. And uh, later that summer, he signed <laughs> Dwight. Um, I, 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 I cannot confirm nor deny that it's exactly because of that, but it certainly wouldn't have helped because he does like seeing this sort of shot blocking. A couple more quick things, and that is the importance of getting the basics right. Um, Atul Gawande in his book Better talks about this a lot. He talks about we're so bad at doing the things that we actually know work. Like we're constantly drawn to the new, to the novelty of a new discovery, and not just like you know, as basic blocking and tackling, right? So a couple of quick ones. Eating well. Um, the most popular food venue for Olympians is that. Uh, at the Olympic Games, here's a picture uh, Bobby Lee took. Now, in fairness, this is right after the closing ceremony, so the line's a little bit longer. But McDonald's is a huge worldwide sponsor of the Olympics. And every Olympiad, you read about people who go and eat like 55 Big Macs and then like wonder why they aren't performing very well. <laughs> I think for most of us, diet is a really fraught thing. Um, I, think, I think we look for these fads. We look for these quick fixes again. And, and this is another place where our individuality is incredibly profound. I have colleagues who've lost a ton of weight on, on uh, low carb, high fat diets. Uh, I should not be on a low carb, high fat diet. That's not how my body processes nutrients. Everybody's body does things differently. Phil Wagner is a sports scientist down here in Menlo Park and has a lab called Sparta Performance Science. His whole thing is just trying to give athletes a couple of things. He's like, it's so hard to get you. Know, I can't give them this complicated regimen to follow. So he's got two rules that he asks his athletes to follow. He wants them to eat one gram of protein per pound of body weight a day. And he wants them to have eight fist-sized servings of vegetables. It's like, look, if they do that, They've done like 80% of what I need them to do. And, and given their travel demands and the schedule on them, that's hard enough sometimes. Here's the other one, and that's sleep more. We have this incredibly strange cultural bias against sleep in the United States. Um, we have this like faux machismo about like, I only need four hours a night. Like that's somehow an awesome thing. Um, so the 2005 Stanford basketball team, they weren't great. They went 16 and four that year, sorry for any Stanford alums in the room. Um, but Sherry Ma, who is a researcher at the Stanford Sleep Center, uh, did a really fascinating experiment with these guys. They volunteered to study the effects, not of sleep deprivation, but of sleep extension. So when they started the study, um, they reported that they slept uh, they reported that they slept almost eight hours a night, actually, by using tools. They discovered that they actually slept about six and two-thirds hours a night. Um, so they, they measured their baseline amount of sleep and then did testing on them. They tested them in uh, sprint performance, doing a shuttle run, uh, shooting free throws, shooting three-pointers. Then they asked every player on the team to sleep as much as they possibly could, do everything they could to sleep more. Uh -huh. And they did. They slept a lot more. They slept 100 minutes a night more, which is you know, almost eight and a half hours a night of actual sleep. And they got better at playing basketball because of that. The, the sprint times went down. They're, this is out of 10 free throws. They made 9% more, more free throws. And uh, out of 15 three-pointers, they made an extra one and, one and change. You know, 9% impor performance improvement is the sort of thing you usually get from doping. 
you know? So I, I'd, I'd encourage you to think of sleep not as a necessary evil, but as a performance enhancer. And um, I'm just I'm completely fascinated by sleep. The only sustainable advantage is to learn faster. This is something um, Scott Dror, who worked at UK Sport, said this to me. And, and it, comes from, it comes out of Shell, Royal Dutch Shell. And actually, this is Ari de Geis, who ran the strategic planning operation at Royal Dutch Shell and really invented a lot of the idea of scenario planning. How do you, how do you come up with business strategies for scenarios that may or may not occur in the future? And he, um, that was his thought, that you know, anything you do, your competition is going to ape almost immediately. Right? So the trick is that you have to be able to learn faster. Uh, the, the way you get to a moment like this is to not be stuck in your ways, to not get stuck in your thinking, and to challenge all of your assumptions constantly. And as I said, that is exhausting. It's brutal. You know, but that's, that's what these guys face. The, the joy and the torment they face is that you know, today's crazy new experiment is tomorrow's baseline. And you just keep, have to keep challenging yourself to move forward. So um, thanks for having me. This is my website if you want to uh, go there. And Who has a question? Hey, thanks for coming to speak. Uh, you Thank mentioned that data has been helping uh, the sports science explode in the last 10 years. Why do you think this is happening now as opposed to 20 years ago? Um, on the data front especially, it's the availability of sensor technology, right? It's the fact that all of us in our pockets have something that have a gyroscope, an accelerometer, a GPS. You know, those things were really specialized pieces of equipment before smartphones. I, I, I think the boom in sensors and, and the way that their price has just like plummeted really has opened up that market, especially for, um, for normal folks. So, uh, so you, you mentioned the picture about the camera in the NBA court, right? So does that mean that it can automatically like, uh, analyze all the pictures? So who take the shot, where, and those data are available right now for, the, for analysis? Yeah. So, um, so getting the whole data set, you have to know somebody. <laughs> um, probably somebody here knows somebody. Um, the, the NBA actually publishes now on their site, nba.com slash stats. They publish a lot of statistics derived from that sport view data. But, but now every game, um, before last season, the league paid to have it installed in every arena. It had only been in about 15 before then. OK. And, and are there other sports, do you think, like camera-based or like image processing-based technology can enable more uh, improvements in the sport? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it is about um, is about under um, baseball has had um, sport vision, which is just down the road here. Does pitch FX and field FX, which tracks tracks the movement of the ball and the movement of players on the court. Uh, tennis uses optical technology to call in and out now. So, you know, there's an interesting, I think, balance between sort of physical sensors and image that sort of image-based thing. You know. Outdoor sports is actually, it's much easier if I just slap a GPS on you and, and, and trace you in an accelerometer and do it that way. You know, indoor sports don't have that luxury, so they have, have some other things they need to figure out. So you talked about um, scouting cyclists based on the SWIFT data, for example, and you also talked about genetics. I have two kids, like five years old and two years old. Do you see a structured way of scouting you know, future athletes when they are young or when they are you know, teenagers? I mean, that's... That's sort of the thing that everybody holds up is like someday there'll be a genetic test you can give your kid and oh, little little Billy can be an X. Um, I'll never say never when it comes to science like that, but we're a long way from that. Let's let me go back to height, right? You know, height's a pretty simple trait in terms of the outcome. When you start to look at the SNPs involved, when you look at the actual genetic variant on the genome that seem to be associated with that variance in height, there's something in the order of 300,000 SNPs. So if something pretty straightforward like height has that huge a, a data set that we have to look at that influences it, something that seems much more complicated to me, not as a geneticist, athletic ability, I, I can't imagine that we're talking about fewer SNPs than 300,000, certainly. And so when people talk about sports genes, there have been genes like ACE and actin um, that that seem to have some association with increased either sprint ability or endurance ability. Um, 
but they, they you know, you can't draw a line between a gene. You know, I think I think that was the sort of dream of early genetics. It's like, oh, there's a gene for everything. And it's like, well, actually, there's like, there is a gene for everything, but every gene is for everything in some ways. So, you know, I, I think what we'll see, what I think we'll see structurally in sports is a, a bigger effort to match athletes to sports based on their their physiology and their morphology, like that sort of height stuff that I talked about. Like, you know, if you know, my dream of playing the NBA died the day that I, you know, stopped growing at five eleven and three quarters, right? So, in terms of the different sports and different countries, how does the technology evolve? Is it like a specific country that really drives something, or what sports are leading? Yeah, that's a great what, question. Um, I think. In what way? I think. Let me take the countries first. Um, Australia, re well going even further back. The Soviet bloc in the 60s and 70s is frankly where a lot of this really got going. Um, in some ways that were really amazing in terms of research and in some ways that were really horrific in terms of what happened to athletes in terms of state-sponsored doping programs when they were told take your vitamins and it was really testosterone. Um, which is an effective way to be a better athlete but to live a really awful life eventually. Um, after that, Australia really took the lead and in the 80s and 90s and sort of the lead up to the Sydney Olympics. Um, Australia made a huge investment. They opened the Australian Institute of Sport, which has really been a world leader here. And that was really the first place in the West that brought together scientific, raw scientific research and an elite athletic population because doing this research on a non-elite population is meaningless in a lot of ways. You know. In the, past, in the past two or three Olympic cycles, the UK has really been ascendant. Um, part of that is because they launched the National Lottery in the UK, and a quarter of the money from the National Lottery is given to UK sport for high performance sports funding and research. Um, the US spends zero dollars as a country on any of this. The UK spends $400 million or so a year. So you know, we're, we're a growth market. The USOC funds some of this, but that's all from corporate donations. In terms of sports, I think endurance sports have traditionally um, led a lot of this because they're easier to measure. Just um, cycling, running, rowing, um, cross-country skiing, it's just like, and, and they're a little more directly physiologically determined. You know, there, there are other things, but at, at a certain point, the size of your engine and your physiological ability is really important. Team sports are way behind. Team sports in the US are way, way behind, but catching up very quickly. So at the end, you mentioned about learning faster, and that seems like a quite a compelling you know, idea. And I was curious to understand if that's also something that you know, comes with a natural baseline and a natural rate of growth or improvement, it, or if that is more you know, learnable. Uh, is learning learnable? Um, I th or fast learning. Yes, I, I would say probably a little. I mean, my answer to almost all of these questions, like. The answer to nature and nurture is both, right? The answer to is so. And so I think that there are probably people who have, you know, Carol Dweck's talked a lot about growth mindsets, right? And, and, and that's really helpful in this context because, again, those challenging, you're challenging your own ideas constantly. And it seems like some people are more inclined to that worldview. I think you can build organizations that support it particularly effectively, and I think, you know, I think we talk a lot about some of that here in the Valley on fail fast and all those, and iterate and do all those things. Um, the trick in the, compet in, in the sporting world, right, is your, your outcomes are very clear. And that's awesome in a lot of ways, right? It's, it would be nice to know at the end of the day, like, did I win or lose? I, I, you know, I sit and I edit a story, like, am I awesome? Am I, no, yeah, it's, it seems OK. Um, but it's also hard because you can, I think, lose focus on process and get very outcome focused. And so I think that's the tension that the sports world faces on that. Great. Well, we'll close with that, with a growth mindset mentality and that we all need to challenge our assumptions. So thanks so much for coming today, Mark. Thank you.